All right, I think it is nine o'clock and we are gonna go ahead and get started with our session today. All right, so I wanna thank you again, if I didn't see you earlier for joining MLSA for our 60th annual conference. Thanks to our sponsors for supporting this event. Um, I'm Melissa DeSimone, the executive director, and I am going to be helping out with this session today. Um, you are in uh, the session with EGLE, uh, the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, with uh, Teresa Seidel, Sarah Lesage, and Kevin Walters. Um, your camera is uh, likely turned off, your microphone is muted, um, and we have it that way to help reduce background noise. And um, also it will help with your uh, connection to the meeting. If, you, if you're having trouble seeing the meeting, the first thing you should try doing is turning your camera off if it's not already that way. Um, if you have questions throughout the session, please feel free to click on chat. Um, you will find that at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will be uh, taking questions at the end of this session today. Um, and when you click on chat, a box or a panel will pop up and you can type that question in. Um, so I am going to go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Um, we are joined by Teresa Seidel. Uh, she's the director of the Water Resources Division for um, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE. She has more than 30 years of environmental protection, uh, including water, wetland, and air quality protection. Teresa uh, holds a bachelor, bachelor of Science in Biology and an MPA in Public Management and a Certificate in Leadership. Uh, Teresa was recognized by Jennifer or by Governor Jennifer Granholm as an outstanding state employee and as a regulator of the year by a Michigan Water Environment Association. We are also joined by Sarah Lesage. Um, Sarah is the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Coordinator for the state of Michigan. She has served in this capacity since 2010, where she organizes statewide interdepartmental efforts to prevent, detect, and control aquatic invasive species. Um, previously, Sarah was an aquatic biologist for over 10 years in the DEQ Water Resources Division, where she worked on water quality issues. Um, we are also joined by Kevin Walters. He's an aquatic biologist with the Michigan Department of Eagle. Uh, his work focuses on aquatic invasive species education and outreach. Um, he's worked for EGLE and the DNR on aquatic invasive species since uh, 2011. He holds a bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife from Michigan State University and a master's degree in marine biology from San Francisco State University. Um, so we want to thank them for joining us today and I will turn it over to you by stopping my share. Great, thank you. Kevin's going to um, run the slides for all three of us so that we're not switching screens to keep this as smooth and easy as possible. But thanks for having us. Uh, super, this is my first time. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I think that's working now. Okay. All right, I'm just going to watch this internet. Um, you know, cloudy days here. I don't understand, but it happens. So I'm going to start with just what the Water Resources Division is all about. You know, the Great Lakes State, Michigan, you know, can be seen from space. It's one of the, the few places where you can just totally identify us. But our mission as a division is to cover all of these things, protection of the Great Lakes, protection of inland lakes and waters, um, streams, all the shoreline work, which has been extreme this past year due to high water issues. The uh, number of coastal dunes we have are just unprecedented and we you know, really stress the importance of those. Uh, in protection and we saw a lot of that again this year due to high water issues. But our overall goal is to ensure that we're protecting the water in the state of Michigan for the designated uses, which can range from anything from drinking water to fishing, swimming, um, you know, just protecting the aquatic ecosystem. So 
you've all probably seen this slide a couple dozen times by now, um, but it's just important to remind everyone the importance of the work that we do in the Water Resources Division. So Kevin, next. This past year, unfortunately, um, we had a significant dam failure, just really highlighting the need for infrastructure dollars being placed in the state of Michigan. While this was a private dam, it did um, still have massive impacts and it, it's difficult for us um, as an agency to work with private dam owners because they don't have access to the resources in the same way that someone um, who is a public dam owner might have. They're not eligible for a lot of the funding sources because they are private. There's also no mechanism in the state of Michigan to ensure that these uh, dam owners have the required financial resources to be able to maintain and continue operation of a dam. That's something that um, really was highlighted in on May 19th, so the one year anniversary is coming up, um, of the Edenville and Sanford dam failure in mid-Michigan. Always try and capitalize on some kind of crisis, right? So we did. Um, we were able to go to the legislature, go to our front office and say, well, we, look, we need more resources in this particular program. And so we did stand up a DM safety unit just um, this past summer. It now has one supervisor and four staff, which is an improvement from the two staff we had in the program total covering um, the number of dams we have in the state, which is astronomical. So we now, like I said, we have four engineers and a supervisor in that program. Um, still not enough, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. We also um, petitioned the Association of State Dam Safety Officials to come into the state of Michigan and do a program evaluation. Uh, look at the overall concerns of the program. What, what are the needs? What are we missing? Obviously, staffing was at the top of that list. But all the other things that you don't think about, funding mechanisms, how do you ensure that we have enough funding for our own staff, but also um, you know, protection funds for dams that are going to fail or that just you users need help with. We don't have a resource for that. So the, that report can be found at the link that you see there. It's um, very long. Uh, you really just need to read the first few pages and then go to the back and look at all the different recommendations. The second thing we did is said, you know, this dams failed, but why? Um, obviously, a lot of water. A, a miss maintenance or un, you know not maintaining the dams for a long period of time, but really exactly what was the, the reason for the dam failure. So the Federal Energy um, Resource Commission and Eagle came together and put together a team um, through this independent forensic investigation to look through what the problems were and they are still doing that work. Normally this is done by the dam owner, uh, but the dam owner just really was not willing to stand up and get the team put together. So uh, FERC and Eagle took over the, the project and got a, a team together. They, the team expects to have a report out on dams, um, specifically the failure on these two dams, by August to go December of next year. So their, their goal was 12 to 18 months, hoping for 12, but expect it to be a little bit longer. This is a pretty complex, um, complex failure, a lot of different factors. Then the next piece was the governor and Eagle director came together and said, you know, we really need a task force to look at the recommendations that came in from ASDSO and put them together with uh, what's the overall mission that should be part of dam safety for the state of Michigan. So that report is also just was released in February and you can find it at the link here on this page. Next slide, Kevin. Just want to give you our, our quick little infographic. Um, you know, there are 2,500 dams in the state of Michigan, of which we only regulate uh, a little more than a thousand. So there's about a hundred that are regulated by FERC, and then the rest are unregulated. These are small dams that were put in years and years ago, um, and the aging infrastructure kind of goes to that. You'll see that the vast majority of the dams have have been in place for you know 50 to 100 years, and that's obviously an ongoing problem. The smaller dams that aren't regulated tend to be for small impoundments um, that homeowners put in years ago. So we're still working to try to figure out where they're all at um, and do they need to be regulated. When you only have two staff covering the entire state and more than a thousand dams, it's pretty impossible for us to get to the ones we regulate. Now that we've increased the staffing, we're, you know, we're excited about that. It's still not enough, but it's definitely a, direct, a step in the right direction. And again, a, a link to the evil dam safety task force which has a lot of recommendations which are going to the legislature and you'll see that in the next few slides. Next slide Kevin. I really wanted to talk to you. Kevin and uh, Sarah are going to give you a big overview of what we're doing in the uh, invasive species program. But I really wanted to talk to you about the funding mechanisms because this is what keeps all of the projects and programs going with NWRD. 
without the funding mechanisms, the work that Sarah and Kevin do and the rest of the staff in the Water Resources Division really gets jeopardized because of the lack of funding. Um, if you look at our budget, if you look just at the WRD budget, our budget it looks massive on paper, but more than 50% of our budget goes out to local units of government. And we like it that way. We wanna make sure that we have the local units of government, that we have small NGOs really involved in the process and are part of the solution to water quality in the state. So quickly going through the, the fees that are up right now, um, our MPDS, stormwater and land and water fees are all, as, as well as the operator certification fees are all up uh, right now for reauthorization. We're as, also asking for increases in these programs. Um, when we start going through these, you'll see that the, a lot of these have not been raised in decades, um, literally decades. We're working off of fees that were almost 30 years old. So try to take your salary from 30 years ago and apply it to today. It's uh, really difficult to continue living on 30 year old fees. Then we have the My Clean Water, we'll go through that real fast, high water infrastructure, the water use advisory, dam safety, and then cooperative lake management program. So Kevin, next. So in the uh, resource program, which is our wetlands, lakes, and streams program, it's the things you, you think of um, along streams. It's the work we do along the shoreline in the state. These fees haven't been raised. Um, oh, sorry, this is the MPDS one. These fees in the MPDS, which is the classic wastewater fees, haven't been raised in 17 years. So since they were initiated in 2004, these fees used to fund um, about 100 FTEs and now they fund about um, 81 FTEs. That doesn't seem like a big drop, but you know that when you think about it, that's a 20% loss in staffing. Um, we This program has historically been funded a third from the feds, a third from state general fund, and a third from fees. And now those fees have dropped down to being just 19% of the funding of the fee category they need. And there hasn't been a makeup um, for what's been missing there. So when it was 32%, the 13% loss um, correlates directly to the loss of staff. We have not been able to keep up in the fees. And so as a result of that, we've lost staff over the years. Those staff do things like inspecting these facilities, issuing permits, doing enforcement, um, doing compliance assistance and outreach to municipalities that need it or industries that are in trouble. This is where all of our PFAS work comes from. So without the additional funding in here, something will have to be cut over the years. Um, we've just had to cut staff because you can't really cut programs. Um, those are required. The programs are required with our memorandum of understanding with EPA. So unless we violate the MOU, which we can't, um, we're, we're kind of stuck. Then all we're asking for in this category um, is a cost of living and then a catch up. So we want to bring the fees up to date and then just add cost of living going forward. Um, when you look at the overall impact of this, if you are in the Southeast Michigan area where a third of the population is located and discharges to the Great Lakes Water Authority, the increase per person is less than a nickel. It's four and a half cents per person. If you're in a smaller community, um, the in increase could be up to 80 cents per person. You know, that seems um, still reasonable. It still does not uh, affect any of our disadvantaged communities by that raise we've gone through and looked at that. So it's important that we try to figure out a mechanism to, to fund our programs more efficiently and sustainably. Next. Then our wetlands programs. This is our wetlands, lakes, and streams programs. This, these are the things that um, you think of along the lake shores that, that you're really working in and the areas that, that you're really concerned with. Um, today, the fees fund 109 staff. Historically, uh, in 1996, when the fee program first came in, it had 168 staff. We, we've lost that many staff in the program um, because of the fees. We cannot, they do, these did not have a cost of living adjustment to them. Um, we have never had an adjustment to these fees. And in this past five years, the workload in this program has increased by 36%. A lot of that has to do with high water, but it also is directly related to the economy. We know that in this program, anytime the economy is doing well, people do work along their lakeshore. Um, and those costs, you know, those are permits that have to come in and inspections that have to be completed. That can't happen when you have a loss um, from 109 to 168 staff. So a 59 staff person loss in this program is dramatic. This is not uh, going to improve until we get some kind of fee increase. So we'll be looking at different ways um, to, to figure out what we're going to cut next, but I'm really running out of rabbits in the hat on, on what to take out of the program and not lose its efficiency and effectiveness. Next, Kevin. So this is the overall fee uh, program that is being proposed to the legislature right now. Um, in the next few slides, you'll see kind of the, the 
the gloom and doom that's happening. But this is what the, the Eagle took forward. Uh, if you notice one of those, the hazardous waste site fees is not within water, but the rest of them are. Um, the overall increase to our program is um, $7.8 million, but that also includes the money to the hazardous waste, hazardous waste program. And as I said, this is all in fees um, back to the user or of the resource. So uh, not a huge increase in comparison to a lot of the other programs, but it's definitely one that would just get us whole. I'm not asking for an increase in staff, I'm just asking to be made whole so that we can continue doing the work we're doing at the levels we have. I would love an increase, but I'm trying to be realistic in the economy that we have. So this is where we're at today. Next, Kevin. So one of the really cool programs that the governor put forward um, a year ago was this My Clean Water. My Clean Water was a $500 million investment in infrastructure. Um, infrastructure is just direly needed for improvements in the state, whether it's broadband, whether it's dams, whether it's bridges and roads, but the infrastructure you don't see like drinking water and wastewater systems. These projects um, were put out there, 207 million for drinking water and then 293 million for clean water investments. Um, unfortunately, these were cut in the budget. Um, so the clean water portion of the drinking water investment, the 207 million, the vast majority of that was funded in a sub supplemental last budget cycle. The 293 million was not. Kevin, you can go to the next slide. If these were the objectives of the clean water investment. And a lot of these come directly back to things that are important to Michigan Lakes, uh, Michigan Lakes, oh my goodness, for MLSA, I'm having a hard time with words today. Um, you'll notice that one of the, the, the most important pieces in here is built down a little bit smaller is the avoidance, uh, going to the smaller waste water treatment plants in the state but also looking for a septic system program to help uh, homeowners by giving small, kind of like an SRF program, a state revolving fund program to the local unit of government to make improvements to septic systems. We, we also wanted to build on the improvements we've made using um, the this, this SOF program, as well as get more green infrastructure out into the environment to ensure that we're you know, doing things that doing things that allow the environment to be protected, um, mostly by getting clean water out of the system and allowing wastewater to be properly treated throughout the state. Next slide, Kevin. So in this budget cycle, um, this is what, what we saw. So the, the Cooperative Lake Management Program, which did get funding last year, which we were very grateful for, was not included in the governor's budget and was sliced in the Senate and House budgets also. Um, we do have Renew Michigan funding. We, we possibly could fund the program um, out of that, which means that that's a loss of one FTE if we do it that way. Um, so we are continuing to fight to find the $150,000 that goes to the Cooperative Lake Management Program to do the monitoring they do. We think it's valuable, but we can't take it out of our budget without losing staffing. So we're looking to find ways to get that put back in whether it's as a supplemental or a, a continuous line item, um, there needs to be some help with that. The water of the Great Lakes State, we really focus on the surface water, but groundwater is a major component to having clean and safe uh, surface water. So we regulate the the use of groundwater in the state, um, the quantity of groundwater in our program. There was $5.2 million um, proposed um, by the Water Use Advisory Council. However, we did not get funding from that from the governor's office and we did not get it in the House version. It is still alive in the Senate version. Kind of be, have that up for you. The dam safety program is uh, a 12 to 15 million dollar emergency fund and we're hoping that that is um, going to be maintained. Uh, MyCor, um, for MyCor, the funding out of Renew Michigan is at this point going to continue, hoping the internet here improves for you all shortly. And we, we hope that that continues. And then the, the final one is the high water grants. Um, these were completely cut in the house. 
and the Senate dropped the high water grants from $10 million to $40 million. So funding for the state um, and the water programs looks a little tough. Um, we're optimistic that when the budget comes through in the end that it'll improve. I know you have two legislators on your call today. You know, I, I strongly encourage you to use your voice to try and ensure that clean water is protected in the state of Michigan, but at, they're really at this point, um, the way the budget looks, it, it's not going to be um, great if we don't get some kind of changes uh, and, and some pushes from, from the local units of government really talking to their legislatures to ensure that funding to the state programs that then funnel back into the, to the local units of governments happen. And that's my overview. We're going to hop into the invasive species portion of this with um, Sarah and Kevin now. Okay, thanks, Teresa. This is Sarah Lesage. Um, for the rest of the talk, um, we'll cover a little bit about the AIS programmatic background. Um, that'll be pretty basic, but we'll also highlight key activities from 2020 and upcoming projects for 2021. Um, we'll talk about Eagle's role in the Aquatic Invasive Species Program in terms of both regulatory and non-regulatory responsibilities for protect, pre prevention, detection, and control. Um, uh, Kevin will then talk about outreach and then how to get involved. Um, it looks like I lost slides here. Are, Kevin, are you still sharing? I am. I'm not sure what happened here. Yeah, someone else uh, someone else started sharing. So I'm going to take this. As, I'm going to stop it. I'm sorry about that. Um, is that better? Yeah, let me go back. Get on there now. I am. Yeah, OK, thank you. Sorry about that. There you go, Sarah. Okay. All right. Um, I also, just Teresa, I'm I'm monitoring the chat. So, um, Kevin or Teresa or anybody else from WRD, if you see some questions pop up, I know we're gonna be short on time. Um, feel free to type into the chat to answer some questions as they come in. Um, Kevin, next slide, please. So I typically like to begin with a couple introductory slides to describe the AIS program before I get into specific updates on new activities and projects. But just to ground us, um, I wanted to mention uh, the invasive species definition. So species that are non-native, but also cause harm. So um, you know we're not targeting all non-native species for this program, but those that are um, cause harm or likely to cause harm to economic um, or environmental interests in Michigan or human health. Um, so we do in our invasive species program uh, cover all ranges of plants, animals, diseases, um, species that are a threat to the, um, the state of Michigan and the Great Lakes Basin that aren't here. For example, big head and silver carp or killer shrimp, hydrilla, those that are emerging um, issues in Michigan like red swamp crayfish, didymo, or European frogbit, and also those that have been here for a long time, like brown goby or sea lamprey, VHS, zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, or fried mites. So it's a broad program. Next slide, please. So our program is collaborative, collaboratively implemented by Eagle, DNR, Department of Ag, and MDOT. Each department and division, we have unique roles, responsibilities, statutory authorities, and expertise. Um, so this is how we're, we're set up um, broadly across state agencies, but you'll hear a lot of mention um, today from Kevin and I about partnerships and how we work um, on all different scales with lots of different partners. Next slide, please. Teresa talked to, about um, Water Resources Division funding. And I want to show you some specific numbers for the aquatic um, invasive, or the invasive species program funding, both the aquatic and terrestrial side um, together. So we do share funding across departments to implement the program. These figures are from 2020. Um, we typically run about $9 million to implement the aquatic and terrestrial invasive species program um, annually. Funding sources are shown. Um, on the left, and most of the funding is from state general funds. We have a lot of support through federal grants, mainly through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And then the remaining funding sources are 
uh, restricted license fees that are mainly used to support program staff. Um, in terms of expenditures on the right, a substantial amount of uh, the state appropriations that, uh, that $5 million are passed through to entities through the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program. So in alignment with what Teresa mentioned earlier, we have over um, a third of the state dollars being, uh, a third of the total program dollars being passed through in terms of um, grants to other, other entities outside of state government. Uh, the state appropriations are also used to support staff, um, shown here as state coordination to implement the program and specific projects. So we have aquatic invasive species projects. Um, some of those are also passed through. They are funded through federal grants and permitting programs. And then we also have the terrestrial portion of the program. Um, and then we broke out law enforcement here. This is specifically for aquatic work. Next slide, Kevin. So I wanna mention um, Michigan's Aquatic Invasive Species State Management Plan. This is available on our website. Um, it, the state management plan is our foundational document that guides the work that we do. Um, it kind of follows the invasion curve from preventing new species, limiting the dispersal of species, early detection and rapid response and management and control. So this particular document is submitted um, by the governor to the Federal Aquatic Nuisance uh, Species Task Force um, for approval. And this is one of the ways that we ensure that we can continue to receive um, federal funding, but also have a, a coordinated um, program that sets the direction for us. Next slide. I think this one sentence or slide uh, summarizes our whole invasive species um, program. Uh, so I'll just read it. So in order to protect and restore Michigan's aquatic ecosystems from aquatic invasive species, a wide variety of partners must take action in the realms of legislation and policy, regulation, information and education, education research and monitoring, early detection and response, and thoughtful on the ground efforts. And so what this means to me um, is that there is no one answer to the invasive species problem, and there is no one entity able to address all of these pieces. So these partnerships across state, federal, tribal, local entities, universities, NGOs, you know, I can go on and on, uh, industry and individual citizens all have an important role in this, this program. Next slide, please. So Teresa kind of grounded us um, in terms of um, what Eagle does and Water Resources Division role. And I just want to point out in this blue box here, um, you know, Teresa mentioned protecting Michigan's waters for swimming, fishing, drinking water, uh, aquatic ecosystems. And the places that we work range from groundwater, surface water, coastal, inland lakes and streams, rivers, ponds, wetlands, um, Great Lakes to connecting channels and dunes. So we have um, within Water Resources Division, um, a wide ranging set of responsibilities I mentioned earlier, both regulatory and non regulatory at multiple scales from the site specific scale, the whole way up to Great Lakes Basin and um, even national at times. Next slide. So I'll get in, um, you know, for the rest of this talk, we'll highlight a few examples of water resources divisions work on AIS. We won't be able to cover everything. There's just way too much to cover. Um, so please, again, type in questions as you go. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have some time in the end or can circle back to questions outside of this time period. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through uh, specifically some water resources divisions work, starting with prevention. Um, I mentioned a variety of scales, um, but we also work on different pathways like ballast water and recreational boating. I'll cover these first two bullets and then Kevin will cover the rest um, later. Next slide. So you'll hear about examples of local and statewide collaborations in a few minutes, but I wanna recognize um, Water Resources Division staff's participation in collaborative projects with partners across the basin. Um, so here are three interjurisdictional projects that are led by partners um, that were initiated in 2020 that Eagle staff will participate in. So these projects are really designed to help advance AIS programs 
regionally. So um, typically there'll be like uh, state advisory boards um, for the project um, so that we can ensure that project uh, products are directly transferable to state agencies. So the first one is about regional invasive aquatic plant control and prioritization and needs assessments. Um, that project will be organized through the Great Lakes Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species um, and led by the Great Lakes Commission and the Nature Conservancy. So that's one we're really looking forward to to help us um, think, think about our aquatic plant um, control needs in Michigan. Next is interjurisdictional boater behavior. Um, so thinking about that recreational boating pathway and how we can best um, work on ensuring decontamination to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. That project is led by Wisconsin Sea Grant. And then the last one is expanding site prioritization into inland waters so that we can think about um, where we need to highlight our efforts in terms of um, preventing new um, invasive species uh, and the dispersal within Michigan. Next slide. Okay, so I promise only one slide on ballast water. I do want to mention ballast water because historically ballast water discharge from ocean going vessels has been the main pathway for non native species into the Great Lakes. So once in the Great Lakes species like zebra mussels can be transported across the re region and inland. Uh, so the state has regulated ballast water discharges from ocean going vessels since 2007. Um, and since that permit was last reissued in 2017, there have been over 200 new use certificates with um, more than 25 vessels having treatment on board. So that's a, a really big advancement um, for what we're seeing with ocean going vessels. Um, in addition, Michigan is actively engaged in participating in the process for implementing um, the 2018 Federal Vessel Incidental Discharge Act. So this is really this, this um, change to the Clean Water Act in 2018 really upends the way ballast water will be regulated um, across the United States. Um, so ultimately regulations established under this new section of the Clean Water Act will preempt state authority. So our input during this time is critical to protect our waters. Um, some of the actions that were taken in um, kind of the December 2010, 2020 timeframe um, we did comment during the public comment period. Um, our governor, uh, Governor Whitmer, did uh, submit a formal objection to the proposed regulations, um, and then we denied the consistency under the Coastal Zone Management Act. So this is something um, staff are actively participating in um, to protect our waters. Next slide. So turning now to early detection and monitoring, uh, Water Resources Division staff mainly focus on Michigan's watch list aquatic invasive plants. And I'll highlight some monitoring efforts that specifically target AIS and inland lakes. Next slide. So some of you may be familiar with our watch list species. I hope you are. Um, if you're not, check out our website um, to learn more about our watch list species. Um, but essentially, uh, watchlist species are those that uh, pose an immediate or potential threat to Michigan's economy, environment, or human health. Um, so they are either never confirmed in the wild in Michigan or have limited known distribution. So the, the piece of the pie here that's highlighted in red are those that have not been found in Michigan. Um, all the others um, have been found um, and we're working actively on those. Next slide. So um, in terms of inland lake aquatic invasive species surveillance, um, Eagle Water Resources Division does targeted surveys in a variety of different ecosystems for different reasons. But one of the ways we monitor for AIS is through targeted surveys using a snorkel and shoreline meander method. Uh, next slide. Uh, the lakes are not randomly selected. Rather, we uh, target lakes, uh, for example, we um, take a look at lakes that are part of Water Resources Division Status and Trend Sampling Program for Water Quality Habitat and Fish Community. Uh, we also in 2020, following European frog bit discovery in, in Western Michigan and Oakland County, we targeted lakes nearby that may have suitable habitats. Um, we do across our um, division-wide programs, 
um, offer the opportunity for input on all types of water quality monitoring. The same is true for aquatic invasive species. So um, let us know um, if you have suggestions for specific lakes um, through that, that process. Um, we've sampled over 90 lakes. Um, typically about 10 to 20 lakes are surveyed each year. We have not found any watch list species, uh, but we have found some new um, non-watch non list detections. Um, all of the data are available in MISSIN um, and staff reports. So let us know if you would like more information on that. Next slide. Uh, turning now to control and management, um, I'll again focus on watch list species. Next slide. Um, so I just want to touch on um, the response when we do find aquatic invasive plants that are on the watch list. Um, this work is led by Water Resources Division. We work closely with the DNR, um, MSU Extension, Cooperative Invasive Species Management, uh, local natural resource agency, landowners, you know, the whole range to implement this part of the program. Um, and you'll see here on this map on um, the sites where we work. And the goal of this, uh, this, this program is uh, to respond to aquatic invasive plants on the watch list with the idea of eradication when it's possible and practical. practical. Um, and so I do wanna mention this is a federally funded program. Um, so these areas where we're working, there is no cost to the landowner. So there, um, you know, there's no real downside to, to reporting species. Um, you know, we wanna hear about these, these species on the landscape. Next slide. So I'll mention a couple key response actions from 2020 to give you an idea about the type of work that's happening on these species. Um, this is just the latest information for 2020. Um, so we've had new detections of European frogbit and Waterloo Recreation Area and Dansville State Game Area. We also have lots of ongoing uh, responses to European frogbit um, and uh, working on implementing a statewide adaptive management framework with cooperative invasive species management area to take, take a broader statewide look at uh, European frogbit. Uh, yellow floating heart, we didn't have any new infestations in 2020, but we have some ongoing work and um, you know, one of the big successes that we've seen with yellow floating heart is eradication in two sites in Oakland and Wayne counties. Um, and so by eradication, we mean um, there hasn't been any plant, plant regrowth in three years following control action. So that's, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good success story. We've seen success also with parrot feather. We have had um, one parrot feather eradication, but in 2020, um, we had two, uh, four new locations in Berrien, Wayne, and Washtenaw counties. So we're working on those as well as ongoing efforts in other locations. Um, and then finally, in 2020, we had one new report of water lettuce and water hyacinth in Midland County, where we hand removed 83 pounds. Next slide. Lastly, under control of aquatic invasive species, I want to mention, um, you know, we've, we've covered a variety of, um, you know, ballast water is a regulatory program. Some of this uh, monitoring and response is non-regulatory. Um, I want to mention one of Water Resources Division's regulatory programs, um, the Aquatic Nuisance Control Program. Uh, state law, the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, um, protects the environment and natural resources by regulating discharges into the environment, but also the use and development of certain lands and waters. So this is one example of a program that's implemented under NARIPA, um, which also protects people's rights to hunt, fish, and use natural resources. So uh, chemical control of aquatic nuisance plants is typically regulated activity that requires a permit. So that's um, an ANC permit, which many of you are probably familiar with um, when targeting species in inland lakes, ponds, uh, streams, and wetlands, also roadside ditches where water is present. Next slide. So a majority of treatment activity conducted under ANC permits is for the control of aquatic invasive species, in particular Eurasian water and hybrid water milfoil, starry stonewort, curly leaf pondweed, phragmites, kabamba, and parrot feather. And so I mentioned this because I want to make it clear that 
these regulatory and non-regulatory programs are all working together, um, sharing information across our division. Um, and so that's really important, I think, for the, the functionality of the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. Next slide. Last, um, before I hand it over to Kevin, I want to mention our Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program. And if you look at the last bullet here, um, there's a link to um, our website and you click on grants and there is a story map. So it's a, a story map that is very rich in information where you can um, learn more about all of the different programs that are funded through that $3.6 million that goes out the door annually in grants. And I think we're at over um, 20 million uh, dollars awarded to over 100 different projects since uh, 2014. This, this grant program is funded through a state general fund. With that, I will hand it over to Kevin and start taking a look at what we have going on in the, the chat. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, Teresa, too. Um, I'm Kevin Walters, the Eagle Water Resources Division. Again, I focus most of my work on aquatic invasive species education and outreach. And so I want to give you a little glimpse into that world um, through some opportunities for you to engage and specifically to people interested in, in lakes and rivers and things you can do for aquatic invasive species on lakes and rivers in Michigan. Um, what I have is a bunch of slides that, that give you a kind of a smorgasbord look at programs and opportunities and things that Eagle is involved with that uh, you might consider for your lake or river or favorite place to, to recreate on the water. And just like Sarah and Teresa, I want to emphasize that even though these are, uh, you know, things that Eagle is involved with, um, there's many, many partners here, whether it's Michigan State University Extension or Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas, um, some of our federal partners, lots of lake associations, in fact, are, are partners on many of these things. I want to recognize those. So um, again, an eagle focused um, slide presentation here, but lots of partners involved. Um, I'm going to talk about the recreational boating pathway first, and then one of the key programs that uh, we're involved with that focuses on the recreational boating pathway is the Michigan Clean Boats, Clean Waters um, program. And so I'll talk about that and highlight those bullets under Clean Boats, Clean Waters there. And then lastly, we'll land on, um, again, that kind of smorgasbord of, of eagle aquatic invasive species outreach activities. So let's jump into the recreational boating pathway. Hopefully, um, these things on, on your screen right now are familiar to a lot of you in the audience today. On the right-hand side is uh, the state of Michigan's boating access site uh, signage that we have posted at um, well, the, the goal is to have these at every uh, boating access site that is managed or owned by the state of Michigan, mostly DNR access sites. So hopefully you've seen these, uh, got lots of these out there. And then on the left-hand side is a, a front and back look at a rack card, um, a, a printed handout that kind of has the same messaging, but this is something again that, that boaters and anglers can, can take with them, keep in their tackle box, keep in their uh, uh, boat, somewhere so that you know what the laws and regulations are for boaters and anglers. And you also know some recommendations for staying in compliance with those things. Um, we distribute lots of both of these uh, free to lake associations, to boating groups, to uh, local partners like counties and SISMAs. So if these are things that uh, you haven't seen or you, you, you have seen and you can use, um, you know, get a hold of me. You can, you can just email me and we can figure out a way to uh, get you in touch with either some signage or rack cards. So again, talking about the, the recreational boating pathway, um, kind of the big umbrella program that helps us provide outreach to the recreational boating pathway in the form of AIS prevention education is the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program in Michigan. And this is a partnership program. Um, Eagle is involved and in, in helps support this program. Um, right now, it is currently housed at Michigan State University Extension, and Extension sort of runs this program uh, in cooperation with Eagle and some, some partners at the federal level who help provide some funding. And so again, the goal of Clean Boats, Clean Waters is to build a unified understanding of invasive species and the recreational boating pathway through best practices and partnerships. And so what does that mean? What does Clean Boats, Clean Waters do in Michigan? 
Well, one thing that we're excited about that we launched last year um, is a mini grant program that provides small grants to um, local groups that wanna do uh, boater outreach and boater education. And I'll show you more about that and what that program funded uh, in the next couple of slides here. Um, it also has a full-time dedicated staff person that is at Michigan State University Extension. Some of you may know the person um, working on this role right now, and that's Paige Felice. Paige is uh, with uh, MSU Extension, and, and she's my partner for Clean Boats, Clean Waters. We're also working on hiring uh, another person that's going to be part of that team. Um, that person should be on board hopefully this summer by uh, May or June. So look for that. Um, in addition to the, the mini grants program that I mentioned, we also have the uh, Eagle and MSU mobile boat wash program that is coordinated through Michigan Clean Boats and Clean Waters and the Great Lakes Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz and other opportunities and materials for voter education and outreach. And so the, the uh, Clean Boats Clean Waters website in Michigan is micbcw.com. So you can find links to most of these materials and programs there if you wanna get involved or learn more. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail about some of those now. And first, I wanna talk about the mini grants. Again, this is new for us for um, this year. We put out a request for proposals in December of 2020. So just this last December, we had a small amount of money to cover the state, just $20,000, but it provided small one to $3,000 grants to entities that want to implement uh, AIS prevention education and messaging to boaters and anglers at a very local level. And so what I have on screen are the seven projects uh, that that $20,000 funded. And these are all kind of getting underway right now. Um, as I speak, Paige and myself are, are working with um, the grantees on the left to get things going in these areas. So if, if this is uh, um, one of your lakes or one of your communities, you can, you can look to see some clean boats, clean waters action on the ground where you where you live or where you recreate through this program. Um, we hope to be able to offer this grant program going into the future, working right now on getting more money um, secured that we can pass on through to, to local entities to as in the form of grants to, to implement Clean Boats, Clean Waters. Um, we don't have that available quite yet for 2022, but uh, we, we hope to. The Mobile Boat Wash Partnership, hopefully there's a lot of people listening right now that are familiar with this. Again, this is a, a three-way partnership between Michigan State University, U.S. Forest Service, and my department, Eagle. Uh, Eagle owns a couple of mobile uh, pressure washers or boat washes um, that are staffed by um, students and interns that are hired by Michigan State University using U.S. Forest Service dollars. And we've had this program in our operation since 2014. And so you can see the five years that we, we've been operating, uh, we've done over 300 events at over 118 locations throughout Michigan, um, contacting um, people who recreate on the water and teaching them how to clean, drain, dry their gear, both through uh, mechanical boat washing practices and things they can do when a boat wash isn't present. Um, you can see the numbers on my screen stop at 2019. We did put the pro program on pause during 2020 um, because of uh, COVID related issues, but we are planning and um, intending to have the program function again in 2021. We hope to be back in the field this year. In fact, my partner at Michigan State University, uh, Dr. Joel Adamore and I have just finished hiring our, our crew for this summer. So hopefully you'll see us out there again this year. The Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz, again, a program I hope a lot of you are familiar with and I hope a lot of you are involved with. And if you're not, I would encourage you to, to become involved. And what the Landing Blitz is, it's a, it's, it is a targeted effort um, through the state of Michigan and in fact, throughout the Great Lakes region, targeted effort during a one week period in the summer where we hopefully empower local groups and local enti entities like lake associations and conservation districts and anybody who wants to provide messaging to boaters and anglers at boat ramps around Michigan during a one week period, usually over the 4th of July holiday period. <clears throat> and you can see this, this event started in 2014 with just 12 sites in Michigan, and it grew pretty steady uh, right up through 2018 and 19. 
with uh, around 80 sites. Uh, again, 2020 last year was different, as we all know, and I can talk a little bit more about what we did in 2020 because we weren't able to be in person at many sites. Um, this year at 20 for 2021, we're already back up to 50 sites, uh, 50 sites that are, are signed up as of this week. Hopefully we get some more going before the event takes place in July, but uh, we're, we're picking up steam again and, and getting back to where we were before uh, the pandemic. And so again, we, we during a one week period, um, empower people to go to their local boat launches and talk to boaters about things you can do to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And as I mentioned, this isn't just a, a state of Michigan thing. In 2019, we expanded this or connected with all of the Great Lakes states and the two Canadian provinces that touched the Great Lakes and, and made this the Great Lakes Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz. So um, hopefully this is how it carries on into the future. And, and this year's event, the 2021 event, will also be a Great Lakes uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz. So, if you're involved or your local lake is involved, um, just know that you're, you're joining a, a large um, partnership of, of people all around the region doing the same thing. So all these little red dots on the screen are places where landing blitzes happened over the 4th of July holiday in 2019. 2020, uh, we weren't able to do the in-person outreach at most boating access sites. So what we did was kind of shift our focus to an online presence. We had a lot of virtual events happening and a lot of social media stuff going on. Um, this year, 2021, we're hoping to still be able to do some of that online uh, activities and online outreach combined with the in-person outreach. So we hope this, this 2021 event will be kind of a hybrid between what we used to do prior to 2020 and what we did last year. And we hope that uh, kind of takes the event to, to the next step. I also want to mention, um, you know, the Great Lakes Commission has been a great partner for helping organize this um, throughout the Great Lakes region. And, and so they actually host the regional website for the Landing Blitz. And you can see that at the bottom of the screen there, glc.org slash blitz. And you can, you can get more information about Michigan's blitz there as well as the regional blitz. Okay, I want to mention some other individual projects or resources, opportunities that you can get involved with. Um, to help protect your local waters from aquatic invasive species. And one of those is the Michigan Natural Shorelines Partnership. And what the Shoreline Partnership does is it, it focuses on restoring and preserving the ecological function of shorelines and uh, works to effectively stabilize shoreline erosion through natural uh, plantings and restoration of shorelines. And so where that intersects with invasive species is um, the shoreline program teaches people and contractors how to use uh, natural shorelines, things that are native to Michigan, to, re to restore a shoreline and to stabilize uh, erosion. And it protects uh, Michigan's lakes through that um, conservation and restoration effort. And so if, if you um, have some shoreline in front of your property or involved with a group that manages uh, property along a lake or a river, uh, I encourage you to check out the shoreline partnership. My course and the Cooperative Lake um, COMP Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch is another program that is supported through Eagle with some funding and again, um, supported through partner efforts over at Michigan State University Extension. And what this program does, if you're not familiar, is it empowers uh, local volunteers to monitor, and monitor their lake for key aquatic invasive plant species. So you'll learn how to monitor for these plants you'll learn how to identify these plants and then you'll learn how to report these plants to, um, to Missin and, and other places, uh, particularly if it's a watch list species. And that's a really key component for us because uh, as Sarah mentioned, we do some monitoring on our own, especially for watch list plants, but we can't be everywhere. There's over 11,000 inland lakes in Michigan. And so uh, partnerships help us to monitor those on a much larger scale than we're able to do on our own. And one of those is the Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch. So if you sign up for the Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch, you'll be trained um, in, in methods for monitoring, simple methods for monitoring your lake and how to identify key priority plant species. And again, how to report those. 
Next, I just want to talk about some resources for aquatic invasive species decontamination. And so we have a training module uh, on our website. If you go to michigan.gov slash invasive species and click the take, take action tab, um, you'll find a, a training module that will teach you how to clean uh, boats, um, equipment, gear, waders, all the things that you might use in an aquatic environment, how you can decontaminate those things when you're moving between sites. And so this is not only useful for you as a, as a private person, but if you're working with, or if you are a contractor or um, a local entity or agency that works in aquatic environments, um, this will show you the proper steps and the, and the most complete steps for decontaminating your gear. I also want to highlight that we have video resources. If you're, if you're not somebody who likes to, to read or maybe you don't have time to read and you want to watch how some of this stuff is done, or you just want a resource to share with your community, your group, maybe a classroom if you're a teacher. Uh, we also have videos that do the same thing. Um, we've got videos that teach decontamination, videos that, that teach the basics of invasive species, um, and videos that show the best steps for prevention. A couple of new efforts that are happening, um, again, right now as we speak, uh, we're working on getting some billboards up um, through some federal grant dollars uh, in Michigan that are going to target boaters and anglers as they, one, come into our states through the southern borders and as they leave our large metro areas in Grand Rapids and Detroit and head north um, to lakes around Michigan. We're going to hope that they see this, you know, some of our simple billboards that, that remind them to clean, drain, dry their boats and gear as they move between lakes. And so we'll have some of these up this summer for 2021, as well as uh, summer of 2022. Hopefully you see these on the, on the interstates around Michigan and um, you know, it reminds you of, of what you need to do when you get to a boating access site and when you leave a boating access site. And uh, hopefully you can share that with, with people that uh, you interact with that are also boaters. Another thing we've got going right now is some AIS outreach kiosks. And you can see on the left is a small version. We have a small, uh, four small, or two, I'm sorry, two small tabletop versions and then four large um, mobile kiosks that are gonna be used at different locations around the state, whether at uh, visitor centers and welcome centers and uh, some at our fish hatcheries, places where people come in and are, are looking to learn something about the environment around them. Um, we're gonna have these kiosks that have interchangeable panels where we can put messaging out about, say, watch list species or messaging for boaters, um, how they can clean, drain, dry, or in areas where we know uh, hunting is, is popular. We have panels that teach waterfowl hunters how to decontaminate their, their boat and their gear and their waders um, so that they're not moving things around like European frog bit. So hopefully you'll start to see these out uh, this spring and summer. We just got these in um, two weeks ago. And we're starting to, to move these around in locations throughout the state. And you can see at the bottom of this, I have a few, few places where you might see them this summer. Uh, one is at the DNR's um, Carl Johnson Hunt and Fish Center in Cadillac, which is a really large um, uh, visitor center that, that draws a lot of traffic. So you'll see one of them there. We've got a few of these. We'll, the small units will keep in Lansing to, to move around to different trade shows, boat shows, sport shows, that kind of thing. And then again, we've got a few other large units that are going to be starting at hatcheries and visitor centers, but, but also moved around um, throughout the seasons to different locations. We've also got a variety of publications um, that we try to keep up to date and try and distribute far and wide. And for the most part, most of these are free of charge um, for you if you can use these. We have a uh, a couple examples on the screen are Landowner's Guide to AIS Management. It's essentially um, a summary of all the information we have on our Aquatic Invasive Species website, but in a hard copy printed version. On the right, we have an invasive uh, plant disposal guide. We get that question all the time. What, how do we dispose of uh, plants that are in our yard or plants that are on our shoreline or plants that are on our, our dock and our beach? How do we properly dispose of those? And so that's what this guide does, is it, is it tells you the proper way to dispose of these things. Uh, other publications we have are, are, um, are more um, things that you can hang on the wall or things that you can pass out. We've got a variety of posters. We've got a variety of 
cards that highlight our watch list species and help with identification and reporting. And again, I already mentioned a few of the resources we have that are directed towards boaters and anglers. If these are things that you can use, um, again, in your local community or, or your job or, or the people you interact with, um, let me know and we can, we can try and hook you up with these and find what's best for you. Um, I'm, I'm generally the main point of contact for most of this stuff. Um, so you can just email or call me and, and again, we can figure out how to get uh, your hands on some of these things. Um, Kevin, I just wanted to give you a heads up that we're at 10 o'clock. Um, yep. And I'll, I'll just quickly tell everyone uh, while I, I have you paused that uh, we, I, I've, I have been uh, recording the questions in the chat so that I can share them um, with the staff and uh, hopefully be able to get back to people. And maybe before we go today too, we will um, put their contact information in the chat so that you can um, message them directly with some of your questions as well, if that's okay with with the presenters. So um, Kevin, if you if you wanna just wrap up for us and um, yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll follow up with questions at another time. That sounds good, Melissa, good timing. I'm, I'm just about to the end here. And yeah, yeah people can um, you know, reach out through the chat or we can put our emails in the chat and you can reach out that way too. Um, last reminder here is our, our webinar species, Not My Species um, is a webinar series that we've been, we've been hosting last year and this year. If you haven't signed up for that yet, it's a great way to get more information on what's being done in Michigan for invasive species. And I've got this, this is my wrap up slide, just what we think are keys to a, a successful AIS program. And it's a variety of things. It's staff, it's funding, it's partnerships, it's public participation, research tools, communication, and a sustained effort. And that's what I've got today. Um, there's our general contact information and hopefully we can put, uh, you know, at, at the very least you can put my email in the, in the chat and people can reach out to me for outreach materials. Thank you so much, um, all three of you, Teresa, Kevin, Sarah, um, for joining us today. Um, there were quite a few questions in the chat. So like I said, I am, um, I'm, I'm keeping track of those, um, but I think that if you have questions, the best way to go about getting answers for yourself um, would be to reach out to the Eagle staff uh, directly. And um, you'll see that Sarah Lesage right now is putting those uh, emails in the chat. So she has one for Kevin and one for herself. Um, and I am going to put in the agenda um, in case anyone needs a reminder of the agenda because we are going to go on to our next session. Um, so thanks again. If you, if you would like to show your appreciation to the speakers, um, you can go down to the bottom where it says reactions. Um, you can clap for them, give them a thumbs up. Um, so that, that's a good way to, uh, to show your appreciation for their um for their their time so we appreciate it we hope you will join us at 10 15 um, which is coming up here pretty soon you have two choices again we have the edenville dam failure no loss of life many lessons learned um, with jennifer boyer who's the midland county emergency management coordinator and the other option is um we have conan smith who is the president and ceo of the michigan environmental council and it's going to talk about things that the michigan environmental council are doing um so i hope that uh I hope that you enjoyed this session. I hope you'll join us for some more. And thanks again to Teresa, Sarah, and Kevin.